So today's lecture is a continuation of chapter 16. So last time we left off talking about tyrosine kinase receptors and any kind of binding of ligands or growth factors to these extracellular domains will activate the cytosolic uh, kinase domains. So kinases, guys, uh, are any kind of enzyme that will phosphorylate a substrate. So the phosphorylation then will result in um, extracellular types of target proteins that will keep the signal going, so a series of phosphorylations then. So the receptor itself will autophosphorylate um, because it has two polypeptide chains and they kind of cross each other and they phosphorylate each other. So there's two roles for this. Um, there's phosphorylation of the tyrosine in the catalytic domain, and that increases then the activity of the kinase, and uh, phosphorylation of tyrosine outside of the catalytic domain, and that creates binding sites for other types of proteins to actually bind to and then become activated. So the downstream signaling molecules have to bind to what are known as SH domains, uh, and that then binds specific tyrosine, phosphotyrosine containing peptides of the activated uh, receptors. So SH2 refers to the fact that uh, they were recognized in tyrosine kinase uh, kinases related to SARC. And SARC is also an oncogene, guys, and uh, you might uh, remember I talked about RAS at one point, and Rau sarcoma is uh, another oncogene that was taken from, uh, or RAS was taken from Rau sarcoma. So if you take a look then at this diagram, you have a growth factor or ligand that binds on the outside, sets off phosphorylations. Here's your SH2 domains here. The phosphorylation on the cytosolic side then allows for binding of this. And then this can lead then to downstream uh, phosphorylations. So we also have what are known as non-receptor tyrosine kinases, and they will stimulate intracellular uh, tyrosine kinases. And um, one of the really key things in a lot of cell proliferation guys are what is known as cytokine receptor superfamilies. And these are receptors then for most of the cytokines, and those are any chemical that will regulate cell signaling. Uh, and some of the polypeptide hormones that we talked about earlier. So the activated kinase then phosphorylate the receptor, and then the phosphotyrosine kinase binding will take place, and then there's a recruitment of a lot of different molecules up to the plasma membrane as a result. So again, um, additional non-tyrosine kinases belong to the SARC family, and basically these play a key role in signaling downstream. And they've been shown uh, to have antigen receptors on B and T cells, uh, also in cell to cell and uh, cell to matrix types of interactions. So they're very important. So MAP kinase pathway, and this is the one in the lab that uh, you guys have a handout on. And it's just a cascade guise of phosphorylation. So, Different enzymes, different kinases come into play and phosphorylate other kinases. So MAP kinases are mitogen-activated protein kinases. And they're considered to be serine and threonine kinases because serines and threonines are the uh, amino acid residues that get phosphorylated. So uh, in mammalian cells, they belong to what are known as the ERK family, and that's extracellular signaling regulated kinase family. And again, a lot of the roles of ERK actually evolved from studies with RAS proteins. So RAS proteins then are guanine nucleotide binding proteins. They alternate between DDP and an active DTP bound form. So RAS is activated then by a guanine nucleotide exchange factor, or GEF, that stimulates then the exchange of GDP for GTP. So in this example here, here is RAS when it's bound to GDP, and then when it's bound to GTP then, it's in an activated state, then the gap actually 
removes that phosphate and you go back to an inactive state. So this whole cycle then uh, will continue uh, for RAS activation. Now the GTP hydrolysis is stimulated again by these gaps and if you have mutation of RAS genes in cancers it inhibits that hydrolysis. So what does that mean? It means that RAS is continuously activated and it will drive proliferation of cancer cells. Now again, autophosphorylation of the receptor tyrosine kinases leads to the binding of the RAS and its uh, exchange factors as well. Now again, the next step then, once RAS is actually activated, it will activate what's known as RAF. That will then activate MEC. That will then activate MAP kinase. And then the ERK that gets phosphorylated at the end can go to the nucleus. So here's an example of that, guys. Growth factor stimulates. You get all these phosphorylations. Then your exchange factor is bound. RAS becomes activated. Then that will activate the RAF when it binds. So this is all recruited to the membrane. Then MEC, then ERK and then this goes into the nucleus. Now I want to mention this little zigzag here, guys. If you remember, we talked about pomidolation, meristolation um, before. This is a little parental tail. So as you can see, it sticks right into the plasma membrane. So ERK then, when that finally gets phosphorylated, goes into the nucleus and then it can actually regulate uh, transcription, so that's what sets the cells into um, undergoing mitosis. Please take a screenshot, guys, of this and upload it into your Dropbox. Now, we do have immediate early genes that, that get turned on, and this is mediated by what are known as SRE, or serum response elements and they're recognized then by transcription factors or serum response factors and ELK1. So again, just an idea of how this whole thing works. You have some type of stimulus up here, and then with growth factors, RAS gets activated, RAF, MEC, ERK, and then you have proliferation, uh, differentiation, and cell survival. Now we can also activate MAP kinase pathways through inflammatory cytokines or cell stress. So these then are the GTPs. Instead of RAS, we have RAC, RO, and CDC42, and then different types of uh, RAF-like molecules, MECKK, and then different MECKs, different ERKs, junk, and uh, P38, and this leads to inflammation and cell death. So I actually studied both of these types of pathways for my PhD. Now, this doesn't all happen by magic. <laughs> so we have to keep a lot of these in place. And one of the important things that's needed is to keep the proteins uh, together with what are known as scaffold types of proteins. So in this example here, KSR acts as a scaffold once RAF RAS gets activated, then RAF, MEC, ERK bind into the scaffold and it keeps it all together so we can get our response at the end. Another pathway, guys, is through IP, uh, PI3 kinase and AKT. AKT is considered a survival pathway and basically they're based on a second messenger from the uh, plasma membrane called phospho phospholipid phosphatidylinositol 45 bis phosphate or PIP2. And again, if you look at this pathway, it's very similar to the RAS pathway. The growth factor binds, phosphorylation, here's your SH2 domain, here's your PI3 kinase, this comes in, activates AKT, there's another kinase here that can do that, etc. So there's a lot of different things that go on in uh, cell signaling. We already talked about NF-kappa B, but again, uh, NF-kappa B family are transcription factors, and one pathway is downstream of tumor necrosis factor, or TNF, and that was in one of the papers that we talked about. 
And we also have what are known as toll-like receptors that recognize uh, molecules associated with pathogenic bacteria and viruses. And here's an example of that. Again, if you look at this, guys, all of these pathways are similar in that you have a stimulus on the top, then you get activations, phosphorylations taking place, et cetera, and then transcription uh, occurring in the nucleus.